Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight for the uh, Wildland Fire Forum. We appreciate you taking the time out of the busy evening. I apologize that uh, not more of my colleagues and your outfits are here tonight, but we are working a structure fire tonight. And uh, we are saving a home and, and doing what we're supposed to do. So they'll be trickling in once, uh, once things are in control. But the goal of tonight's forum is to give you information and resources for wildland fires and mitigations to help you be prepared and ready to go in case there's an emergency. The key is to keep our community safe during wildland season and throughout the year. But we want to be proactive about it and we want to be prepared. And all of our guests tonight are going to help you understand and give you some resources and some tips to be that. You can do that around your home and throughout the community. It helps if you help us first. So we're going to be giving you a lot of information tonight about being prepared with mitigation. You are our first responders, our first defense in stopping a wildfire quickly. So before we really get started tonight, I'm going to do what every good fire marshal would like me to do. And that's let you know about uh, the exits, the emergency exits, in case there is uh, something that we need to leave the building quickly. If your exits are behind you, they are marked, and there are also laboratories out in the lobby, and if you go up towards the stairs. So to this evening, we have several different folks from around the county and counties, because we also represent Clear Creek County and Jefferson County. So we are going to have some folks from Clear Creek County, Evergreen Fire Rescue, Jefferson County, and then we also have someone from the Commissioner's Office. I'd also like to thank those that are here tonight, our honored guests. So the area uh, other fire departments that are here, Inner Canyon, Indian Hills, if you can just wave. I know our friends from Elk Creek are assisting us up in the Brook Forest area, or they'd be here tonight. Do I have any other fire representatives here this evening? No? Okay, thank you. This is actually the point where I was going to thank our volunteer firefighters for being here, and to let you know that these are your neighbors. These are people that are in your community right next door to you, and they're the first responders. They will get there and help you whether it's a, a medical call, a fire emergency, or if you're smelling smoke and you think it's a wildland fire. But again, they're a little tied up right now, but we'll be here shortly. All right, let's get the evening started. So the agenda tonight is we're going to start with the sheriff's departments, again from Clear Creek and Jefferson County. Then we're going to get a state of the fire district from Mike Ouija and Chris Johnson. And we're going to talk about what happens before the fire, how you get prepared before then and then when the fire strikes, what to do then. I will ask if you can hold your questions to the end and to make sure you keep track on your lovely program that we made sure everybody had. There's an area in the back to take some notes. This is also gonna be uh, your resource guide, so hang on to this. On the inside, you're gonna see some, some websites that will be extremely helpful after the program's over tonight. The first one is our website, evergreenfirerescue.com. This is a really good one-stop shop for all sorts of resources related to uh, CPR training, wildland fires, any type of emergency or information that you need about the local community. Also, you're going to see some information from Jefferson and Clear Creek Sheriffs. Their sites have some great mitigation information for you. The Colorado, Forest, sorry, the Colorado State Forest Service also has some information on grants for mitigation. Code Red, which is a fantastic site that we'd like you to sign up for, for emergency notifications. The state of Colorado has a site for, uh, uh, and has some information about mitigation and some tax deductions regarding around mitigation. And then FireWise. FireWise is a fantastic program that Doug South is going to talk about later. So again, we ask that you hold your questions to the end. Feel free to take notes on the back. And with that, we're going to get started. I'm going to actually ask uh, Commissioner Casey Ty to come up and say a few words. Sir? Hi, I'm Casey Ty, one of the three county commissioners. Uh, Don Rosher and Faye Griffin couldn't be here tonight, so they're down in Arvada giving some awards to some uh, high school students 
for doing some great things in Jefferson County Schools. But I want to make sure one of us was up here so we could uh, hear what, what is being uh, the education we're getting here. This is really important, and I'm really glad to see that these uh, uh, volunteers in the Sheriff's Department are giving you this information from the Forest Service. And the neat thing about this information, a lot of it is useful in a lot of different emergencies. We learned in the last uh, couple months that uh, floods can happen in, uh, in this area, any other type of disasters. So I think a lot of this information is probably good for different types of uses. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to learning a lot here tonight. If there's anything you need from, uh, from the county, the Sheriff's Office is a great resource. You can also contact the county commissioners. Uh, it's uh, www.jeffco.us. There's contact information for any of the county commissioners. We'll be happy to work with you. So thanks, and I appreciate this forum. I'm looking forward to learning a lot. Thank you, sir. Let's get started tonight with the Clear Creek Sheriff's Office. Uh, you're going to hear from Rick Albers and Rick uh, and Rick uh, Rick Saint tonight. Good evening. Thank you for coming. It's a great turnout. I'm going to try to keep as brief as I can. If you're a Clear Creek County resident, uh, we have a couple of programs that we uh, have. We have free slash disposal at our county landfill. We have some flyers out on the desk. Those from April 15th through uh, September 30th. Uh, we have the chipper program. We have a bunch of slash. If you don't want to carry away, you can chip it up on your, um, on your own property. There, there is a price to that. Both of those are for Clear Creek County residents only. Uh, Right now, the Clear Creek County Sheriff's Office has a wildland team, but uh, we're all getting older, a little bit more <coughs> overweight. So we're having a back to or working with the uh, fire company at Evergreen Fire. We're probably going to transform into more of an IC team or incident command team and uh, assist them with that. We're on evictions. I think that's, we're, we're seeing more of that on these fires where we're, you know, having people, uh, not evictions, but evacuate, uh, evacuations. So, I think the Sheriff's Office is really going to start concentrating on that this year, trying to get notifications out, this type of stuff. Uh, we're going to try to get more information out on the code red, make sure everybody in Clinton County is signed up on the code red, which is the same for Jefferson County, because that's a good way to get a hold of folks and uh, educate people, you know, make sure that when you go home, maybe you try a different route to go home. That way, if the normal route that you take home is blocked off by fire, you know how else to get out of your house. Uh, we have some, uh, Flyers up there, ready, set, go, kind of prepares you, what you need to do around your house, this type of stuff, what you need inside your house, uh, to get ready to uh, get uh, evacuated. We've got some mitigation stuff out there. We have our contact cards out there, business cards. Myself, Sergeant Safe. I also have the OEM director. She's a great resource for information. Uh, call Rick or I. We'll get you uh, whatever you need. So I will keep that brief and we'll answer questions at the end if you have any. All right, thank you for coming.
Mark Gutke. I'm the uh, director of the uh, Critical Incident Response Unit of the Sheriff's Office. Simply, if it glows, burns, and blows up, we handle it. Uh, speaking about tonight's chores, uh, I wanted to uh, pass along the uh, slash program dates. Uh, once again, we're we're kind of in a transition, looking for a permanent site to do a year-round. Um, we're gathering tools and so forth, but the big thing is where we're going to site a permanent. Uh, so we're doing that, but if commissioners beckoning, we were uh, given the funds again to do our three weekends uh, in Jefferson County. The first one in June uh, 21st and 22nd is in Cold Creek Canyon, Highway 72, way up towards the Boulder County line. Um, July 12th and 13th will be at Conifer High School, just up the road. Uh, again, it's Saturday, Sunday. And then August 9th and 10th will be at Inner Canyon Station 3 down at uh, 285 and Settlers. Um, that's our three weekends we have planned. <coughs> Commissioners give me a budget, and so far I've busted it every year. Um, so uh, he's here. Right? <laughs> no, we have to call, we'll get permission, but they're all for it. Uh, they understand the necessity for it. So uh, I too will be around uh, to answer any questions. Uh, regarding fire response, uh, I have a fire management officer in my office and three three guys that do fire mitigation, and they'll be working uh, two grants this year in the southern part of the county. Uh, we'll work them from March to November. We do pull them away to help with fires. They're already carted and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I'll be around for any questions, so I'm going to turn it over to Dell. Hi, everybody. I'm Dell Kleinschmidt. I'm the captain of the Mountain Precinct. Um, Great turnout tonight. And what this is all about tonight is being prepared. Anybody a Boy Scout out here? Because that's what this is all about, being prepared. Um, first start is with you being here. There's a whole lot of information that was mentioned earlier about the websites. Please go on there. There's all kinds of things on there that don't deal, deal just with the fire. Um, like we talked about earlier, some of you had to deal with on the floods. You got a 72 hour kit. The number of people that I talked to, that haven't done a home inventory, it's kind of scary, especially when it's been in your backyard. So please, take, take advantage of the information that's out there. Um, give you a little idea of what we've been doing. Every year our agency does all kinds of in-service training. This month it's all been about wildland fire and, and uh, other training, but the main one for this group is the wildland fire training. We want our guys to be up to speed and understand what they're looking at because one of our goals as well is unify our command with the fire department so we're all on the same page. But that also means we have to talk the same language. So a lot of training going in for our guys, um, including equip even equipping the cars to give them a fire shovel because oftentimes our guys are out there first. And if it's a little campfire, we can get it put out before the fire department shows up. So we're trying to do all we can with that. Uh, evacuations, there's always concerns about evacuations. If you get a code red notification, we've talked about it before. If in doubt, get out. Don't ask me if you should get out because if you do, I'm going to tell you to leave. I'm going to say, yeah, leave right now. Don't. That's what you need to do. If you have any doubt, get out. So be ready for that. Go back to the beginning. Be prepared. Have your kit ready to grab and go. So again, just a reminder, jeffco.us, great information on there, as well as a bunch of the other websites that we talked about in your uh, flyer. Thanks for being here. Good evening, everybody. I'm Carlos Ananti. I'm the Animal Control Manager for the Sheriff's Office. I'm going to talk to you a little bit tonight about what animal control does during our wildfires and other emergencies. Just a few slides for you, and I'll make it very quick. Basically, what, what we have learned through the years is that uh, people are very attached to their animals. They value them. When it comes to emergencies, we all know that 
uh, at the beginning and the end of the day, human life and safety takes priority over everything. But people value pets, and they value their livestock, and they're going to take risks to either get them out or protect them, or they won't leave because they don't feel like they can evacuate with them. So basically, our role here is to help those people who can't get their animals out, get them out so they're out of the way of the fire department and the uh, deputy sheriffs who are trying to get in there and do the, the work to keep your uh, lives and your property safe. So we have a supporting role here, and we are um, all about helping you get yourselves and your animals out of harm's way. Um, we fit right into the county's incident management team. We're a uh, branch under operations. I usually have myself or some other staff members at the incident command post. We put up a staging area where all the uh, animal responders uh, gather to get their assignments to head in and, and remove uh, pets and livestock. This is a more detailed look at what our organizational chart is for the uh, animal response piece. We are fortunate in this county we have uh, several hundred volunteers, members, neighbors in your community that volunteer thousands of hours and all their time and equipment and expertise to help you out when, when there's a need. And uh, like I said, we're very fortunate to have them. We certainly couldn't do this uh, without them. As a matter of fact, the sheriff, this after our events in 2013, the sheriff gave the Jefferson County uh, Animal Response Team a professional conduct award, which they were well deserving. Uh, basically, what we do, we, there's two parts to what we do. We help move the animals out, the evacuations, and then unlike people, we can't send them to the Red Cross shelter, so we have to put up shelters for them. So we um, shelter livestock at our fairgrounds generally. We set up a, a shelter at the Red Cross facility so those people who have pets and are staying at Red Cross can keep their pets right there with them. And then our regular animal shelter, the Foothills Animal Shelter, sets up and uh, takes care of pets at, at no charge during the, the length of the incident. Uh, we were very busy in 2013, as was uh, fire and police and sheriffs, and we had four major events that we were involved in. And as you can see from, from some of the numbers, we do move and take care of a lot of animals. And again, um, thanks to the, the volunteers who help, um, they make this possible. The biggest message we have for you is include your pets and livestock in your family emergency plans. Um, we have a table out back with some pamphlets on tips to include pets and livestock in your plan, and we're happy to answer some questions. There's some volunteers back there that are uh, happy to talk to you about their role and what they do as well. So uh, thank you for coming tonight, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about these great volunteers. Thank you. We appreciate uh, the sheriff's, both sheriff offices being here this evening. It means a lot. We are partners in crime. Or maybe not crime. But we are partners. <laughs> we are partners and we do work together when there is an emergency. So we, we do appreciate the other support. With that, I'm going to ask uh, Chief Mike Weegee to come up and give us a statement of the party. <coughs> Thanks everybody for being here. Um, I just want to give you a state of the district update. Last year I was standing up here and we were talking about how dry it was and how low the reservoirs were and how bleak the outlook was right after that early wet spring. But as we saw, even with all that rain, um, the fuels out there were still really dry. And the story's not that much different this year. Uh, the flood, the only benefit of it was it filled the reservoirs up and the water tables better, but uh, left us with a lot of damage. Um, these high winds we've been having just is drying everything out. And they, if you walk through your yard, whether it's, you know, on a south-facing slope, it's just crunchy grass, and that is really scares us. The, the fuels that are out there are still really dry, so uh, we're going to ask everybody to help us out this year again. Call early and call often. If you see smoke, you smell smoke, call 911. That's what we're here for. We'll get out there. We have to get on these things early um, to get a jump on them. 
So the snowpack's a little better this year. If you like skiing, you're, you're loving it. Um, farther west, they're getting tons of snow. We're not getting that snow. Um, hopefully March brings us some moisture so we green up some, but we're just not seeing it. And again, those thousand hour fuels, as we refer to them, the dead stuff on the ground that's bigger, it takes a lot of moisture for that for those fuels to wake up and get wet and they're, they're still really dry. So we're, we're nervous. Um, the spring's not looking too good for us. Um, the message tonight is really regarding mitigation and what you can do to help us out. Um, there's a document that we've had out there since 2007 called the Community Wildfire Protection Plan. It was built for the community. Uh, I spoke about this last year, but I think it's really important. What it does is it details out each neighborhood, uh, each subdivision, and what was seen in those subdivisions and um, gave some advice of how those subdivisions can clean up and um, change their, their structure so they're more protected from wildfire. Um, another step that some neighborhoods have been taking, some subdivisions, is they're working on their community wildfire protection implementation plans. And that's taking our CWPP and drilling down into it and actually putting it to work for them within their own subdivisions. Um, I want to congratulate Floyd Hill and Highland Hills. They continue to have their Firewise Community Award and have really worked hard on their CWPIP to try and prepare that whole hillside for wildfire. Um, Upper Bear Creek area is also working on their CWPP. In fact, they just completed it. And the Echo Hills area up on Sinton Road, they're working on their CWPIP. Um, and it's just neighbors getting together. Uh, they're under the direction of a gentleman I'd like to introduce. His name is John Chapman. He's been coordinating these groups. John, can you stand up? He's Go ahead. Yeah. I, uh, I've been working with community wildfire protection plans up down the front range for about seven years. I retired from the National Park Service. And I was doing this under some brands before they I was working in Clear Creek County to work on these plans when the areas of Buffalo Bear Creek and Echo Hills came to me. And we talked about the fact that there was a good plan already in effect for the Urban Fire Protection District, but I talked to, to Mike about doing these plans that we drill on now to take the recommendations in the Evergreen plan and perhaps based on the additional needs and develop those recommendations into actual project descriptions that could then be used to interface with the, with the fire department and perhaps other agencies like the Colorado State Forest Service and the Forest Service in your area to try and move forward on some mitigation action and also to help you to work with your neighbors on the most important aspect, which is homeowner defensive space. So I've been working on those, and I'm more than willing if any of you have HOA or areas in the Evergreen Park Protection District you'd like to talk to me about perhaps looking at doing something to your area, to schedule me after the program, I've got a, a handout, I can also leave with you that it is a little bit more in mind my personal information. So glad to do it. Thanks, John. John's done some great work with the help of Kathleen Krebs, who's the emergency manager in Clear Creek. Uh, they've worked closely together with these neighborhoods to um, get them going, trying to coordinate that effort. It does make a big difference. Um, some of the fires we saw the last couple of years, mitigated areas stood a much better chance of surviving than the unmitigated areas. And unfortunately, we're seeing it as these fires roll out. So, uh, if you're interested in talking to John, he'll be outside later. Um, we'd like to keep that ball rolling. Uh, there's some areas in our district that we really want, need the community to step up and start start taking those trees out, taking the slash out, and start you know really digging into it. Um, if we can't get trucks in there and we can't get our apparatus through you know through all that thick forest, it, it makes it really hard for us to fight a fire. So. Please talk to John. Um, and that's the message I want to leave you with tonight. We really need your help. Not only when something hits and you see smoke or smoke smoke, please call us. Don't worry about what time of night it is. Don't worry about, you know, I'm not sure. If I did it just smells like smoke. Just call. We have to jump on these things early. Um, and 
Start getting together with your neighbors. Work on your own yard. There's a lot of documents out there that will help you with what you can do to mitigate your property. So please, um, let's get to work and let's try and help ourselves against these wildfires. Thank you, Mike. I'd like to have uh, Chris Johnson, who is the Chief of Operations, come up and talk a little bit more about uh, when the fire strikes. I'm going to echo the message of everybody else, which is uh, thanks a lot for coming tonight. Um, i got to tell you, it's eaten me alive to have a structure fire going and uh, come to an event like this. But uh, honestly, uh, this is important to me, too. I think that if we can get the message spread, uh, that mitigation is important and hopefully help you guys get your neighbors going, you can find a way to help keep our firefighters safe and keep the community a lot safer. So in my, in my way, I'm hoping to gain a couple hundred extra firefighters tonight by getting you guys to spread the message of mitigation and what it means to us from a fire protection district's perspective. So, um, and also along those lines, we really need firefighters. So uh, if you have that time, please stand up and uh, join us. Recruiting starts always. Uh, but the class starts in August, so if you're interested, please join us. Um, okay, so a little bit about how we orient ourselves uh, at EVFD. We've oriented uh, all of our people, resources, and training, notification, and response towards zero dollars of wildland fire loss. Uh, that being said, as a fire department, we're going to do absolutely everything we can to keep those fires small and protect your lives and property. But someday it's just not going to be up to us, uh, and I hope everybody here understands that. Um, our approach to risk, we're going to risk a lot to save a life, we're going to li risk a little bit for property, we're going to risk nothing for something that's already lost. Um, so what are the firefighters going to actually do with the fires here? Um, I expect these firefighters to think and act decisively to contain wildfire threats as quickly as possible while first accounting for life safety. If you're going to fight like you wouldn't believe to kill these fires when they're small, well, we will never risk the lives of one of our firefighters in doing so. And I hope that's also understood. Um, so what can you do to help us out? Uh, you can call us early and often. We love running calls. <laughs> um, don't block those roads, like uh, Chief Luigi said. Uh, we need to get in while you're coming out, so make sure we have a path to do that. Uh, the other thing that you can do is just mitigate your property. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in depth here in a minute. But that's really important. And then finally, please don't start a fire. <laughs> All right, so there's three categories of structures that we work on when we, when we uh, work in the Wildland Urban Interface, or WU. Um, in the Wildland Urban Interface, there's, there's three classifications. There's a structure that's not threatened, and that would be a structure that's either so mitigated and so well protected that it's just not, we don't feel like it's at risk of the you know, incoming fire front. Uh, but typically, those are actually structures that are outside of the fire front area. Uh, we still would patrol those, make sure nothing you know, crazy is happening behind the scenes, but uh, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time and resources in protecting those structures. There's threatened and defensible. This is probably what you want your house to be if there's an inbound fire fire. And this is where mitigation counts. So these are structures uh, that have an adequate safety zone and maybe a temporary refuge for our firefighters. Uh, these, these have a high probability that the structure will be damaged or destroyed if the fire front passes through and there's not suppression in place. Uh, and finally, there's threatened and non-defensible. Hopefully this is not your house. A threatened and non-defensible house would be non-mitigated or someplace that's extremely dangerous for us to be operating. And you'll know it when you see it, especially when you look through our checklist. Uh, these are houses with just totally non-mitigated property, uh, trees right up against the house, uh, dangerous escape routes where we can't get trucks turned around, get people in and out of there. Uh, these are places that um, I would not send my firefighters to uh, potentially survive a fire fire. Um, we have three primary tactics that we work with relative to these structures. There's check and go. A lot of times we'll do a check and go for non-defensible and threatened properties. And what we're doing there is we're knocking on the door and we're doing everything we can to save your lives, and probably the lives of your pets. But we're not going to hang out there, because we know if we do, we'd be putting the lives of our firefighters at risk. So we're going to check the house, make sure you're out, and we're going to move on. Uh, there's prepping, though. This is also probably a non-defensible house that's also threatened. 
place where we would feel unsafe operating if the fire truck passed through. And uh, what we're going to do there is we're going to do a very rapid uh, preparation of the structure. We're going to go, we're going to move wood piles away, we're going to move propane tanks out of the way, we're going to move deck furniture off the deck. We're going to spend 15, 20 minutes prepping the house for the incoming fire fire, but we're not going to stay there. And there's a couple reasons we might not stay there. Could be fire weather conditions, could be the mitigation of the property in general, it could be uh, the wind, it could be the time it took us to get to the structure. There's a lot of factors. But really what it boils down to is we don't feel like we could survive the incoming fire front if we stayed at that house and protected it. And then finally, there's prep and defend. This is the type of house that we want to be at. This is the type of house that you want to have. Because we're going to stay there, we're going to fight that fire, we're going to do everything we can to protect that uh, property while the fire front is moving through. And this is an intense place for us to be. <laughs> you can imagine. Um, but uh, it's an appropriate tactic when a structure is threatened, but based upon the fire forecast and behavior, will be relatively safe for our resources to defend, to defend when the fire front comes through. Uh, and this is what we hope all of your houses will be like. Um, if you have proper, properly mitigated your property and neighborhood and fire weather conditions uh, permitted, we can use a prep and defend approach. We'd love to. Um, as firefighters, this is what we want to do. We want to knock that fire down and save the house. I mean, that's, that's good stuff. Um, and trust me, if you want to have a house that's you're able to prep and defend, um, that's the type of place you want to be living. And if you help us create that space, uh, you can, prep, you can uh, protect your property. And more importantly, you can help keep my firefighters safe. Um, you can save your house, but you can potentially be saving the lives of Greg, Matt, Kane. All the guys you see in yellow, you're going to be out there risking things. If you have a nice place for them to work, uh, that's safe and properly mitigated, and you can survive an oncoming fire front, uh, that's a great place for them to live and work. So I need your help uh, in terms of keeping the district, your properties, and my firefighters safe uh, as we move forward. Um, in terms of uh, EVFD wildfire resources, um, like I said, we are orienting our entire organization towards zero dollars for wildland fire loss. We've got tons of training that we're going to do every year, including exercises coming up this month. We're going to go through our wildland recertifications, and uh, we're always going to be available. So I'll wrap up tonight. Um, again, we have our firefighters. They're all coming back from the structured fire here, so we've got some more people to help out. And uh, again, thank you guys very much. One of your neighbors in the Kittredge area, he leads uh, our, our team of warriors, I should say, and uh, he, he is a very big, influential person and is a strong, strong leader for us. Doug, can I ask you to come up and talk a little bit more about uh, being prepared? Good evening, everyone. I'm going to hold on to this because I can't bend down that far. <laughs> First and foremost, I want to thank Ryan for the use of his facilities. He's the principal of the high school. Thank you, and we'll clean up afterwards, I promise. <laughs> and also, Christy. Hi, Christy. Hi. Christy is our uh, head dispatcher, um, dispatch supervisor, and she's got a daunting task of getting us to the call. Uh, after you call 911, we talk to her. Her staff is going to be taking over uh, a lot of dispatching for the Mountain Valley Fire Departments. Uh, that's going to be happening pretty soon. I don't think the Chiefs talk about that. Um, but there's going to be a good six departments under us now, I believe. So uh, the mutual aid that we have now with the Sheriff's Departments and the Fire Departments, if we need help, we know they're going to be there. We have a unified command system. When we have a forest fire, they're there to help us out. They're there to help us with the Code Red system. Um, Evacuations are going to be led by the Sheriff's Department. I think the firefighters are going to be fighting the fire, but you know, uh, most of the mutual aid that we have, the, like tonight, we had Elk Creek coming over to help us out. Indian Hills was toned out, a couple other departments. So it's an amazing group that we have and the way they act and work together. Tonight's talk is about mitigation and the information you see in that banner right there, it says, Are You Fire Wiser? That is a program that the Colorado State Fire Chiefs have adopted. 
And we have on our webpage, evergreenfirerescue.com. So if you go to that, there is the FireWise program and there's the Ready, Set, Go program. And like I talked about last year, if you weren't here last year, I talked about that last page. And that's your incident action plan. You have to have a plan. Get your bag by the front door. Get your belongings that you need to have when you leave your house. We have wildfires. We live up here because it's beautiful. People live in Florida <coughs> that they have hurricanes. They need to know when to evacuate. Okay? So mitigation is the key. If you can protect your house, you're going to help protect us, and we can you can help us protect you. I've got a couple slides. Um, the first and foremost is the levels of evacuation. This was enacted about a year and a half ago after some fires in, in the wildland. And it is a level one, two, three. To go over that, early evacuation is a level one notification. That may be just a notification to you that there is a fire on your block or on your street or in your neighborhood. It's just telling you, hey, there's something going on, we're notifying you. It may be a wildfire a half a mile away, a mile away. If you go back to a uh, wildfire a couple years ago, the Hayman fire, in six hours, the area that that fire took was the size of Evergreen. So if that puts it into perspective, we're going to get this notification out as soon as possible. The next notification is a little evacuation notice, and that's residents are advised that they need to evacuate. And they usually go off of the blocks or the subdivisions or the area. If you get that notification, it's time to go. Don't wait for a level three. Let's start evacuating at a level two. If you get a level three notification, you're behind the ball. The time factor in between those notifications, it may be five minutes, it may be 15 minutes, it may be an hour. Be prepared. Those are my facts about wildfire. <laughs> we start January 1st and we end December 31st. And if you've lived in this area very long, you know that. We've had an amazing amount of fires in the last couple months. Structure fires can turn into forest fires rather quickly. We've had a total of 24 fires in the last two months. Not just structure fires, but campfires, cooking fires, you name it. Those are just the total number of fires. We've had nine structures, including tonight, that's 10. So, they happen all the time. Make sure your smoke detectors are working, your batteries are working, you're working. We need you to work to protect your own home. Code Red, the information outside. Uh, there's somebody from Leadership Evergreen here. Can you raise your hand? Ah, there she is. And you got one right here. Um, they've been helping people in the community at events sign up for Code Red. Um, will you be back there for some question and answers afterwards? Great. Um, I'm going to send them to you if they have questions about Code Red. It is a system that you attach your cell phone or your home phone and register it with Code Red. If we are, are going to do a reverse 911s, it'll be sent by Code Red. Clear Creek County, Jefferson County has that, Broomfield County. And while we're on that topic, March 5th, we are doing a two county wide, three county? Clear Creek as well? Just two county. Broomfield and Jefferson County is doing a test of the Code Red system. So don't be panicked on March 5th, next Wednesday, at 9 a.m., you're going to be getting a call. If you're registered with Code Red or you're at home, they're going to reverse that back to your home and do a test of the system. With that many homes and that many houses that are covered, businesses, if you imagine a bank with 84 phone lines, it's going to take some time to get those Code Red sent out, even with the best computer systems. Obviously, mine's not. Um, but uh, it'll take from 9 to about noon to get all those notifications out to those two counties. So be prepared. That's coming. 
Code Red has a website that you can sign up your cell phone. Uh, high speed notifications to your computers as well. If you go on there, you can get notifications about weather alerts, tornadoes. There was a tornado on top of Mount Evans, just so you know, a couple years ago. Am I correct? correct. Did you have to evacuate? Okay. Um, the tornado was so slow, but they got some good pictures of that. They really did. Um, it will, uh, you can go into weather alerts and be very specific. There are some that you can put into two phone numbers. Um, I have to verify that with Code Red people. Uh, but you can attach it to another address as well. So if you're taking care of somebody at their home, uh, you have a second residence, which I don't, but if you do, uh, you can register that to your cell phone as well. Uh, schools get notifications uh, by Code Red as well for lockdowns. You can get those notifications as well if you're in that area. I'm going to get it back to Stacy because we've got a lot of questions and answers to do. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Apparently, I have to move this back down. <laughs> this is the time that we're, we would like to take questions, and I'll ask if you have a question, please stand and speak loudly and clear, and I will try to repeat it and try to direct it in the right, to the right person. So at this time, do we have any questions? Which would be a state fire. 
Uh, they then bring in all sorts of extra uh, resources in terms of money, people, rigs, all that kind of stuff. And finally, they'll raise their hands and say, this is a type one fire, we need federal resources. Uh, at, which, at which point, we'll bring in federal resources. The governor's involved at that point, um, and you know we're on CNN at that point as well. So, uh, you know, it's not necessarily is it half of Evergreen on fire, it's whether or not we think half of Evergreen will be on fire. Uh, and that's usually the question we ask ourselves when we're, when we're doing this. A lot of times we can't tell. Um, it's as best we can determine based on you know, what we've learned. But it's when we get to those type one fires that we gain access to the federal resources. And, you know, like we're saying, that's, that's a lot of money at that point. What, what is the average time lag as far as when you put a request and you get support? You know, again, it also depends on where the resources are staged and, and kind of where the fire weather is and all that kind of stuff. Typically, a type one would happen over the course of at least a day to get that level of attention and resources in place. Um, when we go to a type three, that can happen in hours very easily. A type two can happen in hours as well to go to a state fire. If you go to a type one where it's federal resources and that number of people, um, it'd be tough to do that in, in a day time, probably two days to get that actually done. Thank you. I was just going to say, there, there is a threat matrix that we follow, um, and it's what kind of threats we have. When, when we start moving on living structures, it, it, it goes fast. Uh, the State Forest Service and, and I meet, and we go through these things almost hourly to see where we're at with the fire, and uh, bring it up to it. On your behalf, the commissioner pay into the emergency fire fund into the state. Uh, and if the threat gets to a certain level and we reach the scoring matrix, then the state accepts it as an emergency fire fund and funds become available and becomes essentially a state fire. <coughs> Even while the locals are still in initial attack mode and the county is assisting with single engineer attack and all that kind of stuff, calling more resources, a lot of that can be paid now by the state. It lessens the impact on the district and the county. But I will say that Jefferson County, because of our urban interface, the amount of people living in the forestry area and up to it, Jefferson County pays the highest amount of contribution to that fund. And it's, uh, it's essentially an insurance policy. And we use it every year. Uh, and for some darn reason, we end up being the first one. And we got to get away from the house. Quit it. Quit it. Real quick. Uh, last year, one of the problems we had was there were bigger fires going on in Arizona. And so we're looking for help on our fires. And, and they said, well, if we're diverting our services to Arizona, so we're going to have to wait. And also this year, there will be a challenge. Hope we have a late fire season, a late fire season at all. We're resurfacing the runways at uh, Rocky Mountain Airport. So the plane's going to be up in four columns until uh, about June. <coughs> so hopefully we can get that resurfacing done early and we won't have any fires. What about using Centennial? I'm sorry? What about using Centennial to the depot? Uh, you know, uh, Centennial does not have to re refill of the retarded uh, ground. And we hopefully by, by June we'll be ready to go. Good question, thank you. Any other questions? Great. Yes, sir. The state has talked about acquiring three C-130 transports very much like uh, uh, Peterson Field has in Forest Life and Firefighting. Has anything been done beyond the talking stage in acquiring those three that would be out at uh, Jeffco? And if so, why can't we lease those to surrounding states to help defray the costs of those when we are not having a heavy lift fire? But has anyone talked about this? Uh, mine's sure, the, the question was, do we, uh, are, uh, are we looking at additional resources, especially in the air area, and maybe renting those out? Gentlemen? The, the, the conversations we've had down on the hill, 
I'm like, oh, that was just four hours there. <laughs> but uh, you know, our conversation down there is the governor is trying to do a pact within multiple states to share the wealth, share the cost. Um, all we've heard so far is there's a lot of debate about the cost, the numbers, and how they would go about sharing those costs. Uh, they're trying to privatize it, offer it to sponsors essentially to pick it up. So you can see the advertising Coors Miller on the side of the point. Um, there's, there's a lot of debate about how it's going to be funded. Casey, have you heard anything else? Just the talking stages, so that things sound great. Yeah, so we've got it. It isn't ironic when they talk about the cost of the three aircraft that the Fort Collins fire and the two Colorado Springs fires exceeded and the money that had to be spent to put them out, the cost of those three airports. Isn't that ironic? What's that tell us? Any other questions for the, the group? Yes, sir. Uh, how can I go to uh, find the frequencies for the uh, Evergreen Fire Department? How can you, uh, where are the frequencies for the scanner? Yeah, if, you, if you call our dispatch or stop in our dispatch center, they'll help you out with that. Wouldn't that be a good idea to put on your uh, website? I'm sorry? Wouldn't that be a good idea to put on your website? We, we did. Uh, it's on our Twitter feed as well. So if you look back in the tweets, it'll be on there as well. So the frequencies are on there. Well, can I just feel, uh, cause the, I feel that everybody that made the effort to show up here tonight, got a scanner, and would listen to us during the high fire time, so that, uh, that would be an enormous uh, help. You would have hundreds of thousands of ears, eyes, and noses. And uh, I listen to the, uh, in the office, fire protection that they can always do that 24 hours a day in the uh, high fire season. And if there's anything that I'm uh, aware of, I have a real estate roadmap, I don't know where the street is out far in figure out wind direction and how many hours I burned out or uh, up or down with it, but um, I do feel that that's uh, and I go to the local hill sites where I can see once I know it's out, I smoke it for the <coughs> where I go and I believe anybody else would run, run out of the house to smell the smoke and look for the source. So I feel that that would be something to be emphasized and you could have uh, <coughs> Blinking signs on the uh, port of roadways in uh, this general area saying uh, red flag warning the day turn on the scanners. And if you had 10,000 scanners, I feel that uh, the uh, fire preparedness would be uh, immensely uh, elevated in terms of uh, uh, giving people 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour of warning that uh, something bad is happening out there. And that would sort of be free, free everything. You know, you listen to the mutual aid request roll in in five minutes in four or five departments. And you know, you better start packing up, you better start sort of calling the rules and so forth. So I, I find it rather strange that you all have not emphasized that in any of the literature or meetings or anything. Yeah, you know, I think it's not a bad idea to use the scanning resource, uh, it is there. Um, and there are certainly a lot of folks that, that scan our frequencies, and there's absolutely no problem with that. You know, my only caution there would be um, that's, a, that, that's our communication channel, so it would be hard to necessarily interpret what we're doing into well, actionable intelligence. I think so, if you listen to it long enough, you begin to get I, I'm, with the, I'm not discounting at all. I'm just saying that. I'm saying that, well, I mean, just yeah. to turn it on once a year, if you listen to it, uh, you do get a, a immense sense of respect. Pride in the firefighters, and you would find that people being much more inclined to, to vote yes for no levy increases. Uh, I really think that uh, everybody in this room should uh, get a scanner and uh, turn it on, and, uh, and uh, I feel that that's an extremely important thing. And uh, uh, I just thought these guys are dropping the ball on that. In every fire department uh, in the uh, Mountain District, there's no emphasis on uh, get a scanner. And that's a key thing to have and turn it on 24 hours a day when the forest is long driving and uh, you've got high winds. It's, it's
it's not a bad idea, and we'd love people to have those. And There's another know. app you can use as well called Radio Reference. Um, well, that's that's so good because uh, you, need the, you need the interplay between the jet codes, or in this case, the you recently the uh, sure. Evergreen Fire Dispatcher, and you now we're rolling out into 4, 431, and we're looking for the smoke. Yeah, yeah. For that, you get a, Absolutely. You, know, you, you have to understand fire departments if you're not. It's the people and we uh, totally agree. So yeah. I just feel that people ought to demand uh, and I feel that having a tour key is an obscure incredible art thing and I'll be first first point on your uh, on your website, turn it on. Here it is, here's all the points for all the districts and a lot of people are gonna need it. And I would also like to know in the uh, unified command for the dispatch with Evergreen. Uh, how are the frequencies going to be allocated between each of the uh, car protection districts? Or will there just be a few frequencies? Will this low no frequency still have a frequency? Um, every in the canyon? No changes right now. So I, I think, so the question and the input back here is, you know, can we encourage everybody to use those scanners for more understanding of how we operate? Absolutely have at it. Um, there's a lot of ways to do that. And the information is available on our website. But there's a lot of ways to get information from us. And uh, the most important thing is, again, you can use the scanner, and that's great. Uh, you can use radioreference.com, which is a scanner hooked up to the internet. So we hope to use it on the phone. Not I get it. I understand. Not we get it. Anyway, we we totally understand. Totally and I, okay. We, we got it. What you need. Yep. Understood. Um, and there's a lot of other ways we get information out, such as code red. Uh, which is how you're going to get those level 1, level 2, and level 3 notifications. Make sure you're signing your phone up for that. Um, and incidentally, even though some folks might not like it, our Twitter feed has been exceptionally helpful in actually getting information live from the fires, which we feel like we can actually share, uh, including types of notifications, what's going on with the fire, and uh, we're pretty good at getting that information out, out there. It's a nice resource for us because we're able to do that quickly actually from the fire ground instead of having to necessarily update a website or whatever. So I encourage you to follow either Jeffco's Twitter feed or our own uh, because we're pretty good at that in terms of getting information that we feel is uh, important to share with the public. So. Can I say something about communication? My name is Lisa Ham Greenholz. I'm the marketing manager with Evergreen Park and Recreation District. And we've started working a lot with the fire department to get information out to the people who are on our email list. We have about 9,000 people. Um, I'll be sitting at the Code Red table with Leadership Evergreen afterwards, so if you'd like to get onto that email list when there's a, a major anything happening, you can also get your information from them through us. And just to answer your question about dispatching for the other agencies, um, we're going to still dispatch them on their frequencies. Uh, there's a long-term plan to change that up, but it requires purchasing a lot of equipment and putting it on other fair repeater sites. Um, and we have to get that funded, that's a long-term plan. So right now, Evergreen has all their frequencies. We've had them for some time. We've dispatched, we dispatched Rail Creek before for up to a month at a time as a backup for Jefferson County. So we're familiar with it, and we're going to use that um, for the time being. And then I'll make a question. Comment and a question. Comment for Pine Can is a great resource. Pine Can is a good resource, yes. Including standard fees on the But our property borders a 40 acre dead mountain park, which is very rugged, very steep, very overgrown, lots of deadfall. It's never been needed. Neighbors have harvested firewood. Question is how do you reach out to the local uh, yes. Denver Mountain Parks and other local uh, park services about mitigating their property? Uh, I might have some more information, but the, the uh, Denver Mountain Parks has applied for numerous grants and they've received several. <coughs> 
now have a fire management <coughs> officer that works for Denver Mountain Parks, and they are mitigating <coughs> property. Uh, they've actually even hired our mitigation crew to help them mitigate some lands. Uh, so it, it's coming, and I don't have his name or number, but uh, probably track it uh, through the <coughs> parks, and I think just start putting the bug in their ear and find out where this property is in their plan for mitigation, and maybe you can help push it up. Is there any CWTP groups in that area? Because that could be part of their mitigation plan yeah. in that area, and then that kind of kicks them in the back. notice 
and the fire's coming in your direction, then they will come in 24-7 and they will foam your house as long as they have access, as they were talking Sir, about. Sir, can I ask what your, is your question regarding insurance no, and how? No, it's not regarding insurance. Okay. My question is, how proactive are you to interface with the insurance industry? You know, and there, there have been initiatives and state legislation. So I appreciate everything that's being said, you know, for the things when that fire comes and so forth. I'm just saying there are consequences, and I'm asking, are, are you, you know, proactive in working with the insurance industry, not just having meetings, but trying to put together a uniform criteria that the insurance industry across the board is going to adhere to, as if, because right now it's a competitive thing. Okay, thank you. Um, any gentlemen, would you like to speak on the insurance? Um, the Colorado State Fire Chiefs have been trying to come up with some standard. There's one that the fire service uses, and you're absolutely right. Each agency, as a you know, they're a for-profit company. They're coming up with their own um, mitigation uh, requirements, and it's the state fire chiefs have been trying to approach that as. Um, um, as best they can. I know it's come up in some state legislature lately. Some things got shot down. Um, so we're we're promoting the firewise, and that's we you know we're going to stand behind that. We can't dictate what this, what the insurance agencies are going to do. Um, as far as the insurance companies that are going to send fire trucks out, there's different levels of that. Some will send a truck out, and they'll take a look at your property and you know do just very little and. Um, and then they'll leave. Others go in there and will foam your house. It depends on what kind of level. They have to go work through the incident command post. We, within Jefferson County, have just worked out an agreement, uh, a memorandum of understanding. So they will check into the incident command post before they just go into some neighborhood because, you know, we call that freelancing. If we don't know they're in there, they can get burned over, and we, we, we find them two days later after we went in. So we have to have them follow the incident command system um, and check into the command post, um, and then we can tell them if it's safe to go into that area or if it's not. Um, you know, their lives are at risk too, so if that whole thing is burning, that doesn't mean they're going to go charge it in there and try and foam your house. Uh, so we had to get some kind of agreement in place with them. Jefferson County worked really hard on that to try and get someone an agreement with them so they would check into the command post first. Does that answer your question at all? Respectfully, thank you, and then no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, it's, it's an ongoing process. You know, yeah, I, but it's a financial thing. Everybody's involved in it, and these premiums are going up, and policies are being canceled, and neighbors have to talk to neighbors for who the best carriers are. It's not for me to say, but I've got to talk to neighbors for who's getting the best rates, the best things. And what if you want to sell your house? What if you want to buy your house? Talk to the real estate community as well. It is an issue that is valuable and it's powerful. I understand. And then the fire chiefs have been working on it at the state level and at the national level, trying to get some consensus. You have designated staging areas when there's an evacuation required. The last time we were asked to evacuate, there was confusion as to whether it was a high school, the library, or where it was. Do you have places where you can designate specifically as to where it should go? The question is there are designated evacuation areas. We have some identified areas. You know, we like to use the high schools, we like to use big areas where a lot of people can get to. And it, it totally depends on where the fire is. So um, it's a decision that will be made on which direction the fire is going, um, how fast it's moving, and where we can get people so they're not crossing the pass of a lot of fire trucks trying to get in. So there's a lot of decisions that go into play with that. But we do have um, areas that we have buildings like this that we uh, can make a little. Again, I want to be mindful of the time and. So we will all be back there in the atrium area to answer some additional questions. I'd like to thank everyone for coming tonight, especially our speakers. We really appreciate it. But I'd also like to introduce uh, my associates that are dressed just like me. We didn't plan it that way, but kind of we did. We are in our wildland uh, outfits, so to speak, our personal protective gear. Anyone you see in these lovely yellows, we'd be glad to answer any questions for you about becoming an evergreen a volunteer firefighter, or how to mitigate in wildland uh, protection. 
I will tell you the structure fire that we were working tonight is out. The family got out safely, and it was um, it was a good save from our team. So thank you again for coming. We'll take questions.